Good evening, everyone. I'd like to um, ask everyone to rise for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Will the clerk proceed with the roll call, please? Yes, ma'am. Mayor Litt? Here. Vice Mayor Reed? Here. Council Member Woods? Here, ma'am. Council Member Marciano? Council Member Tinsley? Present. Council Member Marciano uh, is a little under the weather tonight and, and won't be here with us, so uh, we hope he will be doing well soon, and we miss you. Um, before we move ahead to the, the agenda and the reorganization, I, there were a couple of things I, I wanted to say. Um, first off, I wanted to give a personal thanks to our Parks and, and Rec staff and our Emergency Management staff for uh, putting all that training in, into action yesterday. Uh, they were um, amazing. They acted quickly to get about 200 people at the Burns Road Complex into our Cat 5 uh, gymnasium and secured before the tornado touched down. And um, it's a testament to their professionalism and their competency, and uh, they give their all to the city all the time. I also want to thank Fire Rescue and Public Works. It was a wild ride yesterday, something that in the morning I don't think any of us expected. I know their work is not done, and, and they too um, always put the city first, and they're out there for us uh, doing what needs to be done. So um, thank you to all of them as well. On behalf of myself, I wanted to thank our amazing staff across the board and uh, city administration for this past year. It's been my honor to be mayor of the city for this past year, and you all have really made my job easy. You work tirelessly every day to put the, the residents and the city first in everything that you do. And it's been a real honor to work with all of you and to get to know each of you a little bit better. Um, I want to thank fellow council members for their support this past year. You've uh, been there for everything, all of you. And um, especially to my vice mayor, Chelsea, who's been at my side the entire year, learning, absorbing as much as she could, as fast as she could, uh, knowing that one day it would be her turn and she would need to be ready. So with that, I am going to pass the gavel because I cannot make a nomination as mayor. So I am going to pass the gavel to my vice mayor. And I will proceed with the appointment and nominate my vice mayor, Chelsea Reed, to be mayor next year for the city of Palm Beach Gardens. I'll second that. OK, so all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mark. Mark is. <laughs> I, I don't think Mark would Luckily, be maybe he's not here, right? Um, <laughs> with that. Um, your motion passes. Thank you very much. I'm honored. I would like to now open the floor for nominations for the appointment of vice mayor. May I get a motion? I'd like to make a motion to make uh, Chelsea, uh, Rochelle Litt vice mayor. <laughs> Could if I get she'll a, accept. If she'll accept. Thank you. I'll second, I guess, right? Yeah. Sure. All in favor? Sounds great. Aye. 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 Any Mark. opposed? Mark. Mark doesn't. It's, 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 all it's right. Four zero. Motion passes. Thank you so much. Congrats, Thank you. It's an honor to continue to serve with you and for the city. So I'm going to indulge as well, and I want to thank um, our mayor, Rochelle Litt, for doing such a wonderful job this year, and especially to bring in our city manager, Ron Ferris, because of both of your hard work and your leadership this year. You brought us out of COVID beautifully, and our city is in an extraordinary position because of your hard work. 
how much you guys think about our staff and our residents. It is relentless, and seeing it up close has been a tremendous honor, and I cannot thank our, I wanna name all of our staff, if I could, I would, to um, say what an honor it's been to watch our mayor and our city manager and our attorney work with you. Uh, I've, I'm just absolutely blown away every day by the dedication and love for, for, for my hometown, so it's extraordinarily gratifying. Definitely want to um, shout out to our now commissioner and former mayor, Maria Marino. She always used to say that this city, our staff, and our council are a family, and I remember sitting out in the audience a couple years ago going, well, I don't know about that, but she was right. She was really, really right, so thank you guys for folding me into this family. I want to thank uh, Mark Marciano. I'm sorry he's not here tonight. Carl Woods, Marcy Tinsley, and Rochelle Litt for, uh, for doing such a great job for our city. It's just an honor to serve with you. And um, I want to thank my family for supporting me in this uh, crazy decision. My husband, Michael, our children, Taylor and Dylan, are close friends in our family. And it's such a privilege. Thank you for allowing me the honor of sitting up here for another year. Let's dig in. Patty, is there anything that we need to read to make that official? Are we all set? Uh, yes, ma'am. I need to read the title of Resolution 11. Thank you. Resolution 11, 2022, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, appointing the mayor and vice mayor for the city, providing an effective date for other purposes. I'd like to make a motion. I'll second. I'm take a motion. Thank you. Any second? I'll you second. second. I'll motion. I'll That's second. right. I'll <laughs> How about I make I'm already hiccuping. Make a motion. Yes. I will make a motion for Resolution 11. Any seconds? Second. Great. Resolution passes. Thank you so much. All, All in, in favor? favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Any, Any opposed? opposed? All right. So much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patty. Are there any additions, deletions, or um, modifications to our agenda this evening? No, ma'am. Lovely. All right, so we're going to dig right in with our announcements and presentations. I am very excited to bring Daniel Prieto, our Deputy of Leisure Service Administration, to the podium. And uh, wonderful. Thank you. Yep. My pleasure. Sign it. I get to sign this uh, certificate of appreciation. One moment, please. Thank you. All right, now we're official. Congratulations, Madam Mayor. And Thank you. Welcome, City Council. Uh, we are here to uh, Daniel Prieto, Deputy Leisure Services Administrator, for the record. We are here to recognize a valued uh, community partner, uh, Christ Fellowship Church. I'm here to tag team this presentation with some colleagues of mine that have worked closely with Christ Fellowship Church through the years to present and benefit the community in various ways, and they'll talk about those ways. I would also be remiss to not mention that Charlotte Przinski would also love to have been here because she also has worked very closely with um, Christ Fellowship Church and whether it is helping to provide food or household items to families in need or making sure our community events have the support they need, the volunteers of all backgrounds make a difference. But since 2017, Christ Fellowship Church has lightened the burdens of residents and staff through the years. Their positivity and selflessness is pervasive, and it does not matter how great or small Christ Fellowship has been there to serve when asked and not. And I'll bring up David Reyes, Community Services Administrator, to discuss one witness. Good evening, Council David Reyes, uh, Community Services Administrator. But for this uh, moment, I'm Emergency Management, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our relationship between Christ Fellowship and the emergency management uh, functions of the city. Uh, to be honest with you, it, it, words would not come close to really describe the, the partnership and, and, and how Christ Fellowship really works with the city and the impact they have not just on its staff, but in every residence of this city. Uh, Christ Fellowship reached out to the city a long time ago. I remember the first phone call I received from Becky Kyle, their director of missions, and said, we want to serve the first responders, because we know that you guys reach out to the community, 
and that would be a way that we could be part of the community. So how do we do this? And immediately we started communication and conversations on how we could do this. And then after that in 2018, we all familiar with uh, Hurricane Michael hit the panhandle. And we sit down with our city manager and we're talking about, you know, he is asking me, uh, how do we help our fellow uh, uh, city employees in the West Coast, you know, they're dealing with this storm. And we started talking in this mutual aid to where it, each city could help in different ways, put it city to city. But we want to go beyond that. We wanted to actually focus on each of those employees and their personal needs. And from that point, it was born Operation Sister City. So we quickly reached out to Christ Fellowship and said, we have this idea. We need to put it together. And we know how good you guys are on reaching out and doing these big events. So we really need your help. And within seconds, they said, okay, what do we need to do? They met with us. We put it all together. And as a result of that, you all know, for those of you who were not part of the council at that time, the city provided care packages to um, all the employees of the Bay County Public Works Divisions and every employee of the city of Callaway. So we impacted two communities, which in turn impacted who many, how many thousands of residents that were impacted by the work that they did. And we were able to provide basic needs that they needed. Christ Fellowship did a great job. We even did a uh, Christmas uh, event party for the city of Callaway. And we're coming in to put all this stuff together, and then Christ Fellowship shows up with big trucks and, and props and Christmas trees, and we're unloading stuff, and got to the point, like, oh, my God, I don't think we have enough people to unload this stuff. But it was amazing to see all the impact that they made to that community, and it was a privilege for us to be part of that whole process and work together, government and the church. In 2019... Um, so you all know we had to activate for Hurricane Dorian. We didn't get hit, but we had a full activation for that storm. Christ Fellowship provided pre-storm meals for every employee that was activated. Over 350 employees, every fire station, EOC, our families in the Burns Road Community Center, every employee in the community center had food provided by Christ Fellowship. And they were already committed to provide meals for us after the storm. And again, all that, that trickles down to impact our community. So it's just so many different things, but we definitely appreciate Becky's been such a great partner with us, and she's constantly calling. Uh, COVID-19 came, and then all of a sudden, now we're dealing with COVID-19 Becky Kyle calls and say, and most of the stuff is a call from them. It's not even initiated by the city. So she makes a phone call that we want to serve the city employees. What can we do? Can we go into your parking lot and provide lunch for every employee in the city? You can see in this picture right here, that's exactly what they did. So it's a constant, how can we serve? How can we serve? So again, I just wish to you know, really cover all of it, but I really want to say that the, the partnership is just second to none, and it's been great, and we're looking forward to continue this partnership. Now, I'm just going to have one that's going to also talk about recreation. Good evening, Council. Monette Preston, uh, Recreation Operations Manager for Community Engagement and Events. Behind every event, there's a great team filled with incredible staff and extraordinary volunteers. Christ Fellowship has been instrumental to the coordination of many community outreach projects and special events for our residents to enjoy. In May of 2020, the city organized the Unemployment Resident Relief Fund, which was a program created to assist residents who experienced employment issues caused by COVID-19. After our announcement, Christ Fellowship quickly came to assist without a hesitation. They provided lunch, supplies, and volunteers for this project. Their support of this program was absolutely a success. Christ Fellowship is a joy to work with because they bring positive energy to wherever they go, especially during our community events. Christ Fellowship provided a 2,500 cash donation, supplies, entertainment, and countless hours of volunteers to the city special events. In fact, tomorrow evening, they will be providing almost 100 volunteers and equipment to our Go With The Flow egg hunt that's gonna take place here at our Gardens Park from 6 to 8 p.m. Christ Fellowship cares deeply about the community and steps up to support 
regardless of the event or cost. They partner with the Recreation Department to sponsor summer camp for a single family parent who lost their business due to COVID-19. In addition, they are the organizers for Feed in South Florida that serve many people in our community during the recent economic challenges. With a partner like Christ Fellowship, any impossible task is accomplishable. Thank you. So now you get a little bit of a feel for the impact that this organization has really meant and, and helped and benefited the community. So voluntary service is critical to the success of any organization. Ours is no different. And we'd like to thank officially and formally Christ Fellowship for investing that energy that, that has been laid out um, into uh, the well-being and benefit of the entire community. And to recognize their partnership, we've uh, installed a brick, and you can see a rendering of what the brick states out front of the City Hall, and would like to at this time officially thank Pastor Todd and Julie Mullins, uh, who's here, and Becky Kyle, Director of Missions, who's right over here, and Jazz Jules. Creative Fellowship Leadership, uh, the Creative uh, Fellowship Leadership Team um, for uh, Christ Fellowship Church. And with that, I will have a certificate, and we would like to bring Christ Fellowship uh, representation up. And if you could please come down and take a photo with this group, please. And we can do that right now. For the record, Todd Mullen, Senior Pastor of Christ Fellowship. Uh, I'll make this quick, but it is our joy to have decades of partnership with the city of Palm Beach Gardens. And at our church, we believe our faith in God should make a difference in our community. And so that faith working itself out in simple ways of bringing help to people in time of need, in time of crisis, or just partnering with the city, it is, it is one of those things that brings joy to us. So we're honored to be a part, and our desire is to keep being great neighbors uh, to both you as our leaders uh, of our community and to the neighbors within Palm Beach Gardens. So thank you again for this. This is a beautiful honor, beautiful night. It means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, pastors, both of you and to your wonderful staff. We, uh, most of our council has gotten to volunteer with you all, and we are um, always amazed. And thank you for the delicious food as well. It's <laughs> it, makes, it makes volunteering a little bit easier. Thank you so much. And our, our, on behalf of our city, we want to thank you with the bottom of our hearts. And do any council members have anything else they want to add? All right. And uh, thank you so much, Daniel, David, Charlotte, and Monette, for everything you've done to collaborate with Christ Fellowship. All right, next we have a little bit more information. I'm very excited about this one. I'd like to call up Joanne Scaria, our planning manager, to the podium.
Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. It is my pleasure this evening to present to you two projects for which we are seeking grant funding for through the Palm Beach TPA and Florida Department of Transportation. These items are on the consent agenda. The first project is for the Transportation Alternatives Funding Source. These funds are available for constructing alternative modes of transportation. The city has experienced success in recent years through, the, through this funding source. In 2019, over 300,000 was awarded for pedestrian crosswalk enhancements in various locations throughout the city. In 2020, we were awarded close to $900,000 for the construction of an eight-foot sidewalk and five-foot-wide bicycle lanes on Kyoto Gardens Drive. And most recently, in 2021, the city was awarded the maximum award of $1 million for the construction of a separated two-way bicycle track on Burns Road. These improvements total $2.2 over $2.2 million in grant funding towards alternative modes of transportation. This year, the project that was selected for uh, submittal was Fairchild Gardens Avenue. It's a 0.38 uh, mile long segment of right of way that currently has a two lane divided road and there's 80 feet of width in the right of way. This slide shows the project location which is bound by Campus Drive to the east and Fairchild Gardens Avenue to the west. It is in close proximity to Palm Beach State College, the Gardens Branch Library, a United States Post Office, and Legacy Place, a retail shopping center. There's an existing sidewalk on the north side of the road that is uh, both in and outside of the right of way, um, but on the south side of the road, there is a sidewalk that exists over the EC Theater, but it terminates at their property boundary, so there's no sidewalk on the south side. There are also no bicycle facilities on this uh, roadway. The next uh, slide shows a lot of the community resources that are a uh, factor in the um, scoring of the projects with the TPA. And so the proposed project includes new five foot wide painted and buffered bicycle lanes on both sides of the Fairchild Avenue right of way and a new eight foot wide sidewalk on the south side to complete that connection. The project also includes mid, a mid-block crossing, lighting, and landscaping, and the entire project fits within the project right-of-way. This slide shows the existing cross-section, which features wide travel lanes and a lot of landscaping area. And this slide shows the proposed cross-section, which shows the lighting, the buffered bicycle lanes, um, and then an eight-foot wide sidewalk on the south side. This slide shows some conceptual examples of what the intermittent green paint uh, markings would look like for the green bicycle lane and the, the buffer that would, be that would be included with the bicycle lane as well as what the signage for the mid-block crossing would look like. Here are some photos of the existing conditions. This location shows where the mid-block crossing would, uh, would be installed right by the library and the EC theater on the south side. And this shows where the existing sidewalk ends and where the new sidewalk would continue. These uh, photos show where the bicycle lanes would be constructed. This project was included in the city's mobility plan. And we did receive a letter of support from Palm Beach State College. The application was submitted in February and with all of the required application components. And the last component um, that is required to be submitted is a resolution of support from the facility owner, which is the city council. Um, if the council approves, the staff will uh, submit the resolution prior to the April 29th deadline and staff recommends approval. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I do also have one more application to present, so uh, if, if you'd like to save questions for that time or I can take them now. I think we should go ahead and do both, please. Is that all right? We'll come back for questions after. Thank I'm happy you. to continue. Okay. The second grant application is for the local initiatives funding source. The purpose of these funds is to advance a lower cost, non-regionally significant transportation projects um, that are identified by the local communities. Um, I uh, gave an overview of the transportation alternative projects that we have been awarded in the past, but the city has not pursued local initiatives in the recent years. Um, this is a little bit different than the TA program. The maximum award is $5 million but it does have a longer time frame for funding of five years. 
The project that was selected for the LI program was Gardens Parkway from Alternate A1A to Prosperity Farms Road. It's a 1.5 mile mile long stretch and it's owned by the city. It currently exists as a four lane divided road and uh, there is an existing sidewalk on the north side similar to Fairchild Avenue and a sidewalk on the south side that terminates at the east property line of the landmark. The right of way is 90 feet wide. This slide has a map that shows the project location which is north of the Gardens Mall. Um, uh, so the sidewalk that's existing on the south side uh, starts at A1, uh, alternate A1A and then continues along downtown at the gardens and the landmark and then it ends at this intersection. So the proposed project is to complete that sidewalk connection on the south side all the way to Prosperity Farms Road and then we are also proposing buffered bicycle lanes on both sides of the road. The project also includes several mid-block crossings as well as roadway lighting and the entire project can once again fit within the existing right-of-way. Um, this is an example of the existing cross-section which features a wide median and some wide travel lanes and the project can fit within the existing right-of-way with the new buffered bicycle lanes, roadway lighting and uh, the sidewalk on the south side. Once again, the conceptual examples of the project components of the bicycle lane, the buffered, and the mid-block crossing. And then here are some photos. The, this one shows where the existing sidewalk on the south side terminates right by the Gardens Mall and where the future bicycle lanes will go. You can see there are residents that are already using uh, the roadway to bike and there are also several transit routes in the area. And here we have an example of someone who is using their scooter within the vehicle travel lanes. This is also a project that was adopted in the city's mobility plan. And we received several letters of support from ShopCorp properties, owners of downtown at the Gardens, the MacArthur POA, and the Gardens Mall. This application was also submitted in February and it included all the project components and the last component is the resolution of support from the facility owner. And staff recommends approval of resolution 15. We'll submit the application to the TPA if it's approved by the council. And finally, I would like to say that I am the person that has the privilege of presenting these projects to the council, but putting together the application was truly a group effort. And I would like to thank the city's engineering department, the GIS division, my director, Natalie Crowley, and the city manager, Mr. Ferris, for their guidance and leadership. We all worked hard on putting the application together. So I wanna recognize everyone. And with that, staff recommends approval of Resolution 15. Thank you. It, 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 these are heavy lifts. Thank you guys for working together to bring this. Let's bring it back for questions or discussion. I'd love to start with our Vice Mayor Litt. Thanks, Josie. Um, making our streets safer for pedestrians and, and bicyclists is a great thing. And the fact that they're part of the mobility plan is, is important. Um, I also want to thank staff for the time and effort to go after grant money to do this. That makes it even sweeter that, that we, can, we can do this with this kind of money. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to take advantage of other funding opportunities as well as we go forward to make the city safer. Marcy? I just want to comment. I could, couldn't agree more, and I appreciate uh, you all recognizing these two areas um, as a need for uh, improvement and I use Gardens Parkway all the time and I can attest that the uh, and I was actually surprised at the amount of uh, people pedestrians and bikers that utilize uh, that stretch and of course right near the library and and the other uh, services um, shopping and, and etc um, there are a lot of pedestrians, so I truly support this, and I appreciate you working uh, collaboratively to make this happen, uh, and thank you guys so much for doing so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Carl? No, I really don't have much to uh, agree. All that area needs some, uh, some more attention and bicycle-friendly, pedestrian-friendly, especially that street. So that's a good starting point to keep things going, and you know, you know, you'll have our support going forward. So thanks for doing what you do. Appreciate it. Great. So we talked about this a little bit in agenda review. Uh, my, my two questions or comments are that the next step for this is it goes to the TPA, the Transportation Planning Agency, for review, and then that will be voted on by the Board of Governors in July. 
and then we'll find out if we got it or not. Right? That's okay. Correct. Okay, super. And then um, we also discussed this the other day. My husband and I actually do bike there often and biked to the mall to get a cup of coffee the other day and had a very difficult time coming off that road into the mall and finding a place to put our bikes. So I'm, I'm hoping we can reach out maybe to the Gardens Mall and look into doing something where once we, once we get this done, we have somewhere to put our bikes safely and get to the mall safely as well. That would be it. Next to the Teslas. Next to the Teslas, right? <laughs> all right, wonderful. Thank you so much for all of your hard work. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure, and we appreciate the council support in the previous years as well. Wonderful. All right, so don't go anywhere yet. <laughs> Our last presentation is about the Vision Zero Network Program. Would you mind going ahead and starting on that, please? I would be happy to. Okay, the next item is just a brief informational item update. Um, on the Vision Zero initiative. Basically, in 2016, I believe the city adopted a policy to consider adopting a Vision Zero program, which is a strategy to eliminate all traffic fatalities, severe injuries, and severe injuries while increasing safe, healthy, equitable mobility for all. The Vision Zero Network is an association of cities that share this common goal and work together to share information resources toward this goal. Typical criteria to be recognized as a Vision Zero city include setting a goal year to eliminate traffic, deaths, and serious injuries, um, the mayor or council publicly officially committing to Vision Zero, uh, creating a Vision Zero action plan, um, or committing to create one in a specified time frame, and creating a Vision Zero task force. This map shows the cities that have um, been recognized as a Vision Zero com community. There are several in Florida as well as throughout the country. So just to provide a brief, up, a brief update on the steps completed to date, we've uh, adopted the comprehensive plan policy. We've formed an internal PNZ staff committee. We've coordinated phone calls with TPA staff for assistance and data. We've also coordinated with the city's police department to obtain crash data and the GIS division has mapped the crash data. We've also done research on cities that have been recognized as Vision Zero cities, um, both in Florida and throughout the country. And uh, we also recognize that Boynton Beach and Delray Beach recently adopted Vision Zero uh, commitments. So the TPA staff has been wonderful to work with and they encourage cities to register in the Vision Zero network. One of the steps to be recognized is to complete a questionnaire, which is on their website, and the slide highlights some of the questions on the questionnaire. Staff has done a lot of research on the many cities that have adopted uh, Vision Zero commitments and what is required um, to be recognized. And so one of the first steps is to understand the baseline of the city's injuries. And so we acquired this information from the city's police department regarding injuries, serious injuries, and fatalities from the time frame of 2016 to 2021. This map shows the pedestrian-involved injury crashes. Um, and you can see some of the locations where we uh, have seen pedestrian deaths are North Lake, um, I'm sorry, North Lake and Military and PGA and Military. The next map shows bicycle-involved injury crashes, and you can see several along Military Trail uh, right here. This slide shows motorcycle-involved injury crashes, which we see several along uh, PJ Boulevard and in various locations. And then when we look at all injury classes, uh, crashes that occurred in that time frame, you can see our high-speed networks of North Lake, Military Trail, PGA, Alternate A1A, and, and Hood Road. Um, that's where we see the most, uh, the most uh, issues when it comes to safety. So analysis of this data showed us that 82.67% of crashes occur on 5% of the city's roadways. And this is important for the Vision Zero network because it allows us to focus our funds on the roadways that, that matter most and all of our resources. These are high injury networks, which is a, a way to prioritize these roadways. One thing that staff realized as we were uh, completing this analysis is a lot of these uh, corridors are not within the jurisdiction um, of Palm Beach Gardens. They are owned by Palm Beach County and FDOT. 
So that will be uh, something that we will have to work through to get these safety improvements implemented. And I want to provide some examples of actions that can be included in a Vision Zero action plan. So one example would be some of the things that have been done by West Palm Beach. Vision Zero is highly focused on education for people of uh, all ages, but especially children. Um, they all can include lighting programs, speed hump programs, uh, implementing speed control design. Um, one of the ideas that staff really thought um, could work well here is a, incorporating a traffic garden, which is a small-scale roadway network that's used to teach mainly children traffic safety principles, how to stop at a four-way stop, how to use a roundabout, those types of things. So staff has brainstormed internally some of the actions that can be included in the Vision Zero plan for Palm Beach Gardens. They would include to continue to implement the city's mobility plan, implementing a complete streets policy, educational programs, working with our police department on some of the initiatives that they already have in place, and uh, continuing to work with our developers on mobility improvements. So as far as next steps, uh, staff is working on uh, establishing that task force of all the city departments that are um, recommended by the Vision Zero Network to participate in the Vision Zero Task Force, and then to work with administration and city council to adopt a formal commitment and a resolution. And uh, concurrently, we can also work on developing our webpage, completing the Vision Zero questionnaire, and drafting an action plan. These steps don't necessarily have to go in this order, but that would be the next steps. And uh, that, that completes my presentation for tonight, if you have any questions on Vision Zero. Thank you so much. Another heavy lift. I know this has taken years. I think I saw Dawn at Vision Zero workshops like four or five years ago. So thank you all so much. It's, it's uh, really exciting to have it here in the city. Let's bring it back to, for discussion. Carl, do you want to chime in? Just real quick, the four streets that were the 85%, um, was that the list, Hood and the alternate PGA? And uh, so we had to deal with the county and the state on all of those issues. Ooh. Um, what? Military? Yeah, mil military well, yeah, and just, North Lake. Yeah, I know. It's amazing that, that so many injury crashes occur on the same spots all the time yes. when there's so much traffic on in Palm Beach Gardens generally. So I didn't really have any questions. A great project. We'll see how we can focus on it going forward. It'll seem like it'll be an uphill battle to deal with the state. I'm surprised that the alternate has as many crashes as it does, considering it's straight with, you know, very few traffic signals. Is that like around uh, downtown mostly, or were you able to isolate it that any down anymore? Yeah. Or was it more towards Donald Ross? So it looks like, uh, I mean, we have data from uh, within the city's boundary, so within the jurisdictional boundary. So we see Lighthouse to um, basically up to the Cabana Colony area. Um, we don't see as many fatalities. The fatalities will be marked in red, but there are a lot of injury crashes. Well, it's a great program, so um, I don't have much to say about it other than it would be really nice to fix those four eight and you know that eighty five percent, you know, can come down a little bit and and help. That's it, guys. Thanks. Michelle? I'm good. Okay. Marcy? Uh, really a comment, but, you know, obviously we all agree that one fatality is too much, and, um, and that's why this initiative is so important, and, um, you know, I, I, it helps bring light to those areas, and obviously pictures uh, are worth a thousand, or a thousand words, I guess, um, but it's clear as day, and I'm very supportive of this, and I appreciate you guys um, bringing this to our attention and, and obviously cooperating uh, together to, to make this happen. So uh, maybe the TPA, uh, after this is uh, approved, maybe the TPA can help uh, with those uh, high traffic areas, the areas that we're having uh, issues, and uh, I also love the traffic garden. <laughs> I think that's great. That's on the to-do. I think that's great. As a mom, a mom of three, I, I love it. So uh, I think that's great in education, too. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. In summary, with our mobility plan, uh, using Complete Streets and now Vision Zeros, it's obvious our city is trying to save lives and to get people to think about those around them that aren't in cars as well. And it's uh, great. 
it, now we're having that's it, well hopefully this will pass in July and that'll be five projects that will have used TPA funding which is state funding and national funding otherwise for um, for our roads to be safer so it's a great way to bring safety to our city without touching anyone's pocketbooks either which is huge that's actually extraordinary and then um, I just uh, what, thank you for doing this tonight. This makes me extra proud as a, as a member of the TPA governing board. So, and we have a couple of our advisory committee members in the audience as well, so I know they've worked on this. So thank you guys so much for our staff, and thank you for your presentations. That was wonderful. It was my pleasure. Thank you. All right, we're moving on. Next will be comments from the public. I do have two comment cards for items that are not on the agenda. I'd like to bring Mr. Gary Bernstein up. Mr. Bernstein, will you? Thank you. Come on up to the podium. We're going to give you three minutes if you could state your name and your address. Gary Bernstein. I live at 663 Holly Drive. And uh, I'm here on behalf of myself and uh, other residents in the immediate area. Excuse uh, me, sir. Can you please speak into the microphone? Oh, sorry. Thank you. I didn't even see it. Uh, in the immediate area of the Lighthouse um, Drive um, Railroad Crossing. And why I'm here is to solicit the town to uh, implement a no horn um, quiet zone for the railroad crossing. That has to be done by the town. Um, that crossing has a high um, concentration of homes immediately by the crossing. And what happens, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie My Cousin Vinny, but what happens is in the middle of the night, upwards of six to eight times a night, the horn blasts four times, very loud, and it's disruptive to s sleep for people in the area and also uh, during the day. It's very, very loud horn. Um, the advantage that we have is that the when they made the improvements for the Bright Line, they upgraded the crossings to the requirements that would allow the city to request that that be established as a quiet zone. Um, you have to have the four bladed uh, crossing gates. You have to have the pedestrian crossing gates, the um, audible and visual signals there. The only thing that would be lacking that would be an expense to the town would be a, a couple of signs that say that the um, horn would not be blasting at that intersection. But it is very disruptive. I've spoken to numerous individuals uh, in, the, in the area, and uh, everybody agrees that it does affect quality of life. Uh, in the area because of that loud horn. And that's, that's our request. Thank you so much, and thanks for doing your research about supplemental uh, safety measures. Not okay. everybody takes the time. They just want the horn to stop. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll bring it to our city manager, and we'll get back with you. We have your information. Uh, just the one thing is, as far as quiet zones, once everything is done by Brightline, the conductor will always have the choice of sounding the horn in any emergency, no that's matter correct. what. So that even if correct. we make magic happen and every train horn stops, there's, if there's an emergency, there's you will still hear it. That, which is quite acceptable. At least it's not six times an eve, uh, at night and uh, disruptive of sleep to four in the morning. Earplugs for now, but we'll, we'll get back with you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I'd like to call Douglas Grant Please, if you could come up, we'll give you three minutes, and if you could state your name and address, please. Hi, my name's Douglas Grant. I live at 301 Balsam Street, and I have to agree with Mr. Bernstein there. I live back a bit. I live in Balsam, which is some of those streets that, um, you know, adjoin his neighborhood. And part of that problem is some call resonant frequency. The noise bounces through the surfaces of the house, and they meet back up, and it's just as loud four streets back as it is right at the horn. So I wanted to touch on that, and he was right. He's right. It's very noisy. So I'd like to start out by saying uh, some appreciation. I came here last year, and I was um, bringing up uh, two daycare centers that were on my street, and it was just it was bedlam. And you heard me, and you, you did the right thing, and I appreciate that. And, you know, everybody... Everybody comes up here, me too, ranting and raving about something, but I wanted to give you some thanks to say this, this got done and, and you heard me. Now the bad part. These... <laughs> we thought, yeah, I, th I think uh, you're done. <laughs> I had to start in easy. 
The problem with the two daycare centers that are closed off is they've weaponized their kids. And let me say it again, they've weaponized their kids. Seven days a week from 4.30 to 8, there's up to eight kids screaming their heads off on the street, next to my house, across the street, and one house over. And what it is is they're mad because they, you know, don't have the daycare and the, uh, you know, the ease of taking care of the kids and not having to, you know, uh, supervise them and all that. So anyways, I'm getting sidetracked. The thing is, is that they've done this for two years now. I put up with it for a year because of the COVID thing, and I try to be the good guy and say, okay, we're, you know, taking care of things, and I'm trying to be, you know, um, you know, accepting of it. But this year, I had started recording because it's too much. And it, like I said, it's seven days a week from 4.30 to 8 p.m. And it is screeching and yelling. It's not just kids playing. They are full tilt. And like I said, I've lived with this for two years. I'm trying to, you know, just let the city council know what's going on here. There's one more piece of, of this moving part. There's a neighbor next door to me, 303 Balsam Street. They're running a boarding house for little girls. There's up to five girls staying in there. The parents don't stay there. Very little supervision going on. I've tried to talk to the neighbors. They don't speak the same language. They're... So there's those five. There's two across the street, one directly across the street, and two more. That's about eight. And they're screeching their heads off seven days a week. And I'm just getting to, to tell you this now because I submitted a, a memory stick for this with a lot of the recordings on it to code enforcement, and I haven't heard back from them in a month. So I'm coming here to tell you and let you know what's going on. Thank you, Mr. Grant. No, yeah, okay. perfect. You just made it. Yes. So I will most likely have our city manager connect with you in code enforcement as well. Please, it's starting to affect my health. I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you for coming. Thank you, and thank you for listening. Speaking of which, next is the city manager's report. Thank you, Madam Mayor, council members. I do have a couple of items to bring to your attention this evening. As you heard earlier, from Mo over in recreation. Uh, Glow with the Flow egg hunt is this Friday. I know you all don't want to miss that from six to eight. It should be a very festive activity for children with under, you know, from infants all the way up to through above children 10 years old. Um, the bounce houses, uh, food, play areas. Uh, it's going to be quite an event. I think it's one you don't want to admit to miss. In addition to that, uh, we have had um, uh, a weather event yesterday, in case you didn't notice that. And um, I have to tell you that uh, during uh, this weather event and uh, being in communications with uh, police, fire, community services, uh, recreation, it uh, was quite moving to hear how our uh, individual departments uh, worked together as a team and responded to all types of different uh, emergency situations throughout the town. Uh, I've asked our uh, emergency uh, management director, David Reyes, he wears many hats, by the way, but we wish you'd wear one to know David, it looks good. Uh, <laughs> Asked him to do an after action damage assessment report and uh, report on how our organization responded uh, yesterday. This is, uh, an, uh, I think, uh, an amazing response. And David's responsible for um, the organization and the training and uh, getting things in order. And uh, with that, I'll let David give you a, a brief presentation and a preliminary view on uh, estimate on damage. So David, I can't thank you enough for the job that you do and for the police, the fire, community services, public employees, recreation did an outstanding job of taking care of everyone at Burns Road. Uh, I just can't tell you how proud I am of you and all of the employees who responded so amazingly well yesterday. So David, take it away. Thank you. Uh, good evening again, David Reyes. Uh, right now, emergency management director. <laughs> That's why I lost my hair, because I keep wearing hats. They said it's not good for your hair. 
Um, so I'm just going to give you a brief update of what happened yesterday and mostly concentrate on how we responded to that event. Uh, between the hours of 5 and 5.30 was a very active in this city. The city experienced adverse, adverse weather, a lot of high winds. We had a tornado in one area. Um, but at the same time that this is happening in some areas of the city, uh, we also were getting some brush fires due to lightning strikes. And, and our fire department was re responding. So if you see here, that's why yesterday we call it battling wind and fire at the same time. It's, all this was going on at the same time. Police, fire, community services, all of our crews were activated immediately after that. Some of our crews were already coming in even before it was even ended. We already were anticipating the need of the help, so crews were coming back to work. So here's some of the incidents and what happened. Uh, I'm going to start with our public uh, services response. Our crews, uh, we receive a lot of reports, trees down throughout the city, blocking broadways. We had in different locations. It was different parts of the city. Uh, debris here in the municipal complex, our district park because of the brush fire. Our Burns Road Community Service is one, probably the area that received the most damage, and you'll see that further in my presentation, light poles down. There was a lot of damage to the Burns Road Community Services, uh, to the Burns Road Community Center. Between the hours of 5, 15, 7, 30, our crews went out on the street. We started responded, responding to all the calls. We started removing trees from the road, uh, cleaning and making it safe. Uh, district park was made safe, make sure that nobody at nighttime gets into the park or get hurt, so we make sure everything was safe. All of the city parks were inspected, make sure, again, it's safe. Uh, Burns Road perimeter fence was put back up, so our priority for Burns Road, which received most of the damage, is to make sure the site was safe until we could go back to in daylight and really do a, a, a good assessment to the property. So we make sure all the fencing was back up and put, make everything safe. We turned off power. Uh, we lost a couple of light poles in the, in the, on the pool and the splash pad. So we make sure the power was off to those lights to make sure that nothing happened until, again, we could come back and do a, a true assessment. And we also started taking pictures, documenting the whole event. And the reason we do this is because we treat every event just like it was a major storm. The process is the same regardless of the size. So we follow the same procedures. Then this morning, we came back, continued to do a damage assessment. We uh, started doing cleanup of Burns Road. Our priority was to get the pool and the playground open because those are the ones that the community uses. So we want to make sure we focus on that. Then we move into the construction site where we had a little bit more time. In order to open the playground, we just don't simply go out there, inspect it, clean it, move on, open it up. We actually brought a playground inspector, which we hired on the contract with the city, to inspect the playground and tell us it is safe for our children, so you could open. So we did not open this unit until we ensure that it is safe. That's what we're doing with the competition pool right now. It's clean, it's ready. There's a couple of pieces that we need to make sure they are safe. Hopefully by tomorrow that's completed, and by this weekend, where is our target time to be able to reopen? But safety is a number one priority. We're also working with contractors and getting prices on the cost. At the same time, our police department was really busy, so all, there's a lot of things that were happening all at the same time. About 143 phone calls that were received on our 911 center. 18 calls were uh, service uh, dispatched by the center. And you can see on the list right here some traffic uh, crashes, you know, power lines down. They assisted uh, FPNL. They were assisting FPNL blocking traffic so they could make repairs to power lines to be able to restore service much faster to our residents. They also did a well-being check to the Burns Road Community Center. Everybody knew the Burns Road was hit the hardest, and everybody could see it. So quickly, they didn't wait for a phone call. They made a trip out to Burns Road to make sure, is everybody okay in this building? And they stayed there until they make sure everybody was okay. They also blocked traffic on military trucks to keep vehicles from driving into the, the storm because, you know, you could see it coming. So at, that, at one point, drivers were just, they, they want to get home. It was 5 o'clock. So there was no storm that was going to stop them. So PD had to block traffic and keep people safe. Our fire department was also responding to a lot of calls. They received 16 calls about a brush fire, and five of those was, were confirmed. And you could see in here all the different locations where they actually had a brush fire that they had to attend to. 
And then they also went right away to our Burns Road Community Service, uh, Community Center, and to make sure that everybody was okay. So both fire and police didn't have to get a call from us. They went out there to check on everybody, make sure everybody was okay. They assisted with an electrical power line that was down on a vehicle. So you could see all these things happening all within a window of about 30 minutes time. Our Burns Road Community Services at the time had approximately 120 people on site. So our staff in, uh, in the building quickly put our emergency management procedures into action right away. They didn't miss one beat. They moved everybody into a Category 5 portion of that building that's already been built for that. They put everybody in there. They make sure everybody was safe. They closed the doors. If you could see in this picture right here, you see those garage doors. Those garage doors are built to make the whole section a Category 5 separate from the rest of the building. It's built to do that, and those doors are part of that whole process. So you close those doors, and you turn this entire gym into a Category 5 building. They put everybody there, closed the doors, and didn't open until they knew it was safe to bring people out. Immediately after that, when people went out, their staff decided to go grab a first aid kit and start going around and making sure, is there anybody outside that missed it that needs help? So they knew everybody here is okay, now let's go check and see who else needs our assistance. So again, all this thing happening at the same time. I'm gonna show you just real quick videos, real quick, and kind of show for those who probably missed the action. This is a shot from our police department where you can see how it's starting to build this time. That looks like you see yep. right there. Guy. Here's another one. This is a shop from Burns Road, and this one really shows right there when you came down to the top of our facility. And the last one here is actually a video from the cameras for the pool. So this is from the pool area competition pool. <clears throat> You can see where the shade structure pretty much is damaged beyond repairs. And here's some pictures that show the conditions after everything happened. This is the splash pad. Here's our competition pool and what used to be the shade structure. Here's more damage. Here's some of the light poles that got damaged uh, inside the splash pad. We lost two in the splash pad and one in the playground area. This is a visual of the fire damage over at District Park. This is the area. So, <clears throat> as you all know, I mean, emergency management, we, we, we take in a different approach when we do. So we take in every event, regardless of the size, and we implement the same procedures. We practice, we practice, we train. And when this situation happens, we have the ability to respond quickly to our residents because communication is flawless. We already know who's doing what. PD is helping. Our police department assisted us to make sure that all the streets were clear so I didn't have to have all our crews go and drive the entire city. It takes very long time, so they're doing that for us. They're telling us what needs to be done. So that entire communication allows us to really provide the best service. By 7.30, everybody was going home. The city was safe. So and I'm just going to close by just um, two comments that we have. Thank you to our staff. Um, our, our public services director uh, received a call from Don Levinson. A lot of you know her from uh, PGA, Property Manager Association. And um, she called to say, we have a palm tree that's broken a street, and we want to know if you could send the crews. And then I said, oh, hold on. Uh, the crews are already here. You're already on it. So ignore my phone call. Uh, they're here already. So it just she didn't even have enough time to really report because it, it was already being reported. 
And we also received a text message from Jay Kashmir, which is a news anchor for Channel 5. And uh, he was, happens to be at the Burns Road at the time of the event. And he says, uh, staff at Burns Road Recreation Center was amazing this evening. I had my son for swim, and the sky turned quickly. They move and secure 200-plus people into the gym, a cat five proof, for 45 minutes. Gardens police and fire rescue were there immediately when the doors lifted. Staff at the facility needs to be applauded for their effort. Then they dropped the garage doors in the gym, and I knew something was wrong, but also felt comfort that we were protected, proud of our city. So that's what our staff does, and this is what we're trained for, and that's what we practice for. And thank you for your support to make sure that we have the resources we need to provide that service to our residents. So thank you. I'll answer any questions you may have. Uh, Marcy, you look like you're thinking. Uh, no, there's no words to say when you see all of that except a big, huge thank you from the bottom of our heart. And I was literally driving from 90, from West Palm up here. I had no clue that the weather up here was so bad until I was in it. And uh, I have to say thank you again to Ron. Not only did he uh, you know, participate in the leadership that we just witnessed, but um, he also uh, took the time out of all of this busyness to call to make sure that we were okay. And once I heard what was going on, I was able to get a, you know, a little bit more away from where it was. But I was on military trail right during, right maybe after, I mean, minutes after, not even. And the police were out um, helping the uh, traffic move a little bit along while trees were, the one tree, one big tree was down, but then there were also branches everywhere, not just little leaves and branches, but big, solid um, branches that were blocking, you know, the the traffic, and obviously uh, all over, scattered, big green, huge palm fronds were all over the place, and they were there, and uh, y you could see that not just police, public works, the whole entire team. I watched it as I was slowly, very slowly, uh, driving home, and so it was very scary. Not only was it you know, windy, the lightning, everything else. But I just want to say thank you very much. And it, you know, obviously, pictures speak louder than words. And uh, you know, it's it's hard to see. But thank you. This is why we're the number one city in the United States, or in at least Florida, or United States. Who knows? Thank you, United. United, whatever. It's all good. U.S. is about right. Yeah. I know. I I'm, I think big. How long have you been working for the city, Dave? It'll be 20 years this uh, June coming up. Right. And the city manager, I think, is 21-ish, 20, 21. And then our former police chief, assistant city manager here, right at 20. And then our fire chief, you're what? Wow. Well, they're fire guys. They, you never go away. <laughs> And then I know Joe Correo was a police officer. About 50 with, years, Joe. Huh? Joe's about 50 years with the city. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe and I were young cops here when we were in our 20s. So the reason why I just bring this up is because the longevity of the people that love this city and your leadership just goes unmatched. And it filters through not only the employees but the community. So, um, you know, we love this city. And the, the people that get elected just just don't get elected because it's something to do. You know, they have a passion for, for bringing the city into the future and caring for the people that live here. Um, so I don't have any questions. This is just over and over. This is like a warm-up for hurricane season. So, because um, that's what? Now that clock's ticking. What do we got about 60 days for that clown show to start? But anyway, I, I love all you guys. You guys have been around a long time. And it just shows, you know, what Palm Beach Gardens does. And we continue to lead by example, even with the Sister City presentation earlier. You know, um, Christ Fellowship had a hand in that. But weren't we delivering washers and dryers up there so they could actually be washing their clothes because they had no and generators so they could be washing their clothes and they could get back to work 
to, this is for the first responders so they could get back to work to serve their community and, and get their residences up. So this is what we do, you know, and I'm glad I've been a part of it for my most of my adult life. And I know my council members glow, you know, when you guys do stuff like this. So I love you guys and, you know, and I'll shut up after that. So. <laughs> well said. That was, that was great. You didn't need to ever shut up. Uh, Rochelle. Well, I said my thanks to everyone at the beginning of the meeting, but again, the funds that we allocate, the equipment and, and the training that we enable because of it is such an important part of what we do on council, and it's a, a privilege to be able to do that for you all so that when something like this happens, you just take it and run with it. And, and again, thank you all for, for being there for us. Just, it's, it's, yeah, everyone, you guys are always out before it's even over. You're, you're proactive assistant. You've got immaculate procedures. I don't, when anyone thinks about living, you think about safety first, and I can't imagine um, our residents can feel any safer, especially when you've got our weatherman tweeting out about what a great job you're doing, you know, 15 minutes in. So thank you so much for all you do. Thank you especially for bringing the video so that we could see what everyone was really experiencing. And, it, yeah. and <clears throat> This is, wasn't part of the presentation, but just a quick update. As you all know, right now, the economy, the construction industry, everything is really challenging. And because of it, it's really hard to supply. So we have taken the approach. We're not waiting to the end, just a month before to order. We already got all of our supplies, everything that we need for this uh, next hurricane season, June 1st. We already have it from water to parts that we need to fix equipment, anything that today t t takes longer than normal for us to get because the way the economy is working, we have made a decision to make sure that we have enough in our stock. So if we get into a storm, we don't miss anything and we could continue to serve our community and not have to wait for things to be ordered just because they're not available. So we have already taken that approach. So right now, when it comes to our supplies, we're pretty much set to go ready to go, so we did that. Normally we do that a little bit later, around the end of April, no, May, but we didn't wait this time, we, we're done. We're so grateful for that. We look forward to when we celebrate your 50th anniversary with the city as well, so thank, thank you. you. <laughs> hey Dave, and if there's, a, if there's some way yeah. you can filter this through your staff that the council recognizes that what happened yesterday, and you know we would like to just make sure that we appreciate them, their, their first responding and getting everything done. Um, you know, just let them know we know because everybody knows we pay attention, you know, but it's nice for, for it to get down to somebody and say, hey, the council says thank you. Thank you. We'll do. Thank you, Carl. Ron, do you have anything else to share? I have one other presentation. As you know, um, there's been a lot of interest over the years uh, regarding uh, North Lake, the western portion of North Lake and the expansion uh, of North Lake and why it has or hasn't progressed. I've asked our city engineer, Todd, to be able to put together a program uh, and um, talk to us about the different segments of North Lake, the development or lack thereof, and why that's occurred, and the other uh, coconut extension. So Todd has a presentation. I know you hear it from the western communities of the city as well as the rest of the city trying to travel North Lake. So we've got some updated information and I'll let Todd uh, go ahead and do the presentation. Good evening, Council Todd Engel, city engineer. As you guys know, the Avenue development has many requirements as a roadway network. They have a requirement to connect Coconut to Beeline Highway and they also have a requirement to six lane North Lake Boulevard from just west of State Road 7 coconut and then they also have to do additional lanes from coconut to 140 avenue so i'm going to give you a little update of where they are so they've broken the projects up into, into three phases so the first phase will go just west of state road seven we were supposed to go all the way to state road seven but everyone knows what's going on with state road seven so i don't ask me any questions because i can't answer them um, so we had to physically move our start just west to get out of everything that was going, all the legal challenges and everything. So we were able to get that done. The county worked through that with the Avenir CDD. So now they have a fully permitted project. They still have some issues with some utilities that they're trying to work through, but they do have a contractor on board. It is Cheatham, and 
It's been awarded, and they're looking to issue a notice to proceed, and they'll probably issue a notice to proceed within one to, two, one to two months if they can work out the utility issues that they have. This particular section is 450 days of construction. Um, expect lane closures between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. They won't allow during rush hour, so they'll close the road down, get their work done between 9 and 3. And we're hoping, if everything works out, that the fall completion date, 2023. And again, I always caveat, these aren't my dates. These are dates that are out there to the best of our knowledge. So if the notice of proceed gets issues in May, and it is 450 days, we will look into open up that six-lane section in fall of 2023. So the next section of North Lake Boulevard is from Avenue Drive west, and this is our Willow Workplace parcel, and that's the connector road that's not built yet. So that's the portion, and it does include the coconut intersection there. They do have a contract with Ranger Construction. It has not been awarded yet due to some utility conflicts and some land issues that they're having. So right now, Avenir is finishing up this portion of coconut that connects Avenir Drive to this intersection. The county cannot issue them to, the permit to connect to that intersection due to some land that they have not yet acquired. There's land on the south east corner of there that's already been approved through the county as to be developed, but the county has yet to acquire it, so we cannot complete that sort of intersection. Therefore, we cannot complete the connection to Coconut North, and we can't utilize that signalized intersection. So that's one of the challenges that we have in this section. Also, the county refuses to light the road, so they want the city to light the road. We don't feel that we are going to light their road, so they're holding up the permit on that road based on the FPNL lighting of that roadway. So those are some challenges that we're having with that particular section. But when they get through those challenges, it's a 365-day build with Ranger Construction. Start dates unknown due to the utility conditions, but there's progress and they're looking to get that as soon as these utilities and land purchases get completed. So the other section is they're currently working with the county right now as a joint contract to do some multi-lanes in that, in that area. So that, that will come a little later. Any questions particularly on North Lake Boulevard? Yes. Todd, you said they've got two separate contractors to work on those two pieces. They're not using the same contractor no, the whole way Avenir through? No, the Avenir CDD has awarded one contract to Cheatham for the, for the eastern section, and right. there's an additional contract to go for that second section. Obviously, there'll be another section for the others, another contractor for the other section. Is that usual on a road like that, to have separate it is different. usual to break up, break up big contracts to companies that can do it. So if they don't have enough resources, they'll break these contracts up to companies that can utilize both resources to get the job done. There, there's a break in the middle where Avenir Drive connects to North Lake Boulevard. Those improvements, for the most part, have already been done. It's six lanes on both sides, the sidewalks in. So it's a natural breaking point to go east from one side and west to the other. The other question is, as, as a driver on that road, you're, you're coming down North Lake from, say, PGA, you cross the B line, then you're going to go to six, and then all of a sudden it's going to funnel back down to four? Yeah, well, right now it's, it does a little six four right now. So there, it's going to be a continuous six all the, way, all the way to the west and all the way to the east. So it's so, funneling down now anyway. Yeah, so as you come out of Coconut at six, and then it sort of funnels down by Ibis. And it opens up a little bit again for a turn lane to go into the public shopping center and the funnels back down to two. So that'll be a continuous six from State Road 7 all the way to Coconut. Okay, thank you. If I may, um, you said there were some land purchases on Coconut Southeast Corner. Um, how long has the county been trying to acquire the property and how long have they known about this? I don't have the exact date, but I've known about this for approximately th two to three years. Two, three, but yeah. the development order was six years ago? 2016, six years ago. So we've, they've been waiting that long to try to acquire the property. They haven't yes. gotten it. Yep. The intersection design has been approved for a while, so they know what they need from that property owner. So that property needs to be acquired before that connection can be made to Coconut. Where, where is that property? Well, I mean, I know which corner, but who own, does Avenir own that property or somebody else? No, owns that? that is. Uh, do you oh, know it's who south owns the of property, that. Natalie? I don't know either. It's a, it's a development that's been approved through the county. I don't know who the property owner is, so the county approved it. 
Uh, they've worked out the turn lane situation. They've worked out the access to that property, but the county just hasn't acquired the property so we can complete the design and construction of this. So it's similar to the Congress Avenue. Very similar, yes. Situation. But wait, okay. it was acquired, but wasn't it acquired, it was acquired by a development order, correct? No, they, the county doesn't approval. require things by plat. I mean, we require that they give it to them, but it, right. they don't do it by plat. They have a whole other right-of-way process that they go through, which we're actually going to talk about in a minute. Okay. When I give another update here. Okay, then I'll wait. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, as we go through Avenir, and obviously home sales have been good, so everything's been good. Now they have a projected date for the connection for Coconut up to Beeline Highway, which is a great thing because it is a very, very needed connection. So they have approval for the crossing, so they're physically going to take the crossing that goes into the Corbett area. They're going to close that crossing. They're going to move it to the south would it be to make the connection there to a new rail crossing that has been approved by cxx it is currently under design by cxx so that is underway avenir is currently um, selecting the designer for the remainder of the road that will connect down through to the terminus current terminus of coconut boulevard and, and these are the section the raised section there's a couple critter crossings that has to go between the two natural areas and then there's the other sections as it connects to the north and connects to the south. So that is underway. If everything stays on track, it could be completed by 2024, if everything stays on track with what's going on. So that's the update on the north-south road. We do have uh, an IAP pro uh, project that's in the, the works right now, and it is the turn lane at Osprey Isles. So where we are with the project is you've approved us to go ahead in, in figure out what the actual funding is going to be. In order for us to do that, we need to obtain permits and we need to get with contractors to find out what it's going to be. So in order to obtain permits, I have to give right away to the county. And I have Osprey Isles, the actual residential community is shown in red, and there's a separate Osprey Isle owner that is, is to the south or just to the east there. So I have to get both of these over to the county in approved then we have to relocate all the utilities, and then Palm Beach County will give us a permit, which puts us in a little bit of a bind because we need to know what the costs are, and we'd have to spend upfront costs before we even got the NIAP approved, plan approved, which would put Osprey Isles residents at risk. Of, so we're sort of caught in here, and the county process takes about six to eight months in order to turn over property. There's a lot of stuff that you have to do, and Max will maybe speak a little better than I can on what they got to go through, but they have to do title searches, lien searches, sometimes phase one analysis, and all this other stuff with the county. But we're in the process right now. Osprey Isles had to do a referendum to give the land, so they did that. That's been approved. Now I'm in the process of shifting that over to the county. I'm still waiting on the second owner to go through that process. We've done all the sketch and legal, so we're waiting on him to come in but we're, it's going to be held up at some point. We're, our goal is to get it on the construction of the actual roadway to save us time and save us money. So, but the county process is going to slow us down, and obviously you see what we need to relocate as far as utilities there. All these utilities will need to be relocated before a permit will be issued from the county. So we're sort of stuck, you know, trying to work through this process. It's, it's going to be a little painful, but we'll keep you updated as we go along. Any questions on on that process. Where is that in the six lane widening? Does that fall within what is in here? Osprey Isles is right there. So that's in that first section that's approved for six lanes. So they're going to get another lane. They're just not going to get the turn lane too. Yes, they will get another lane, but they will not get the turn lane. You're correct. Okay. But our, gotcha. yeah, our goal is to do it all at once. once. Less right, disruption, right. Okay. less cost, less mobilization. Makes sense. Same it, it's also better for the yes. traffic, the, the people, the <laughs> residents. It's also better for the traffic as well because when you are diverting traffic for construction for the um, six laning, you can do it all at the same time mm -hmm. when you're doing the turn lane as well. So, yeah. and, and then we've got the B line going on as well at the same time. Yeah. Right. But I think what he's saying is it's. It would be nice if it could all oh, work yeah. um, oh, in conjunction time, sure. with each other. And um, if there's any way that we can 
with the you know, make that happen, that would be it's super. funny how they approved eight lanes so quick, and this, this takes forever. It wasn't quick. The <laughs> approval of the eight lane. No, the eight, the eight lane. The, the eight lane idea. Yes. Okay. But, so there are challenges. We have 450 days. The contractor is going to be out there. We're trying to squeeze this into 450 days. So hopefully we can get that accomplished. It's just it's a lot to deal with the county on how their process works. The land has to be done. The utilities have to be relocated. And the permit will, at that point, be issued. So it's, that's a lot of work. It's unfortunate because when we have all of the right of way within our city, we built a road in not even two months yes. and with roundabouts and everything. So <laughs> it's a shame. Please continue. Sorry. All right. That was uh, illuminating, to say the least. I guess we're through now. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ron. Thanks, Ron, for asking Todd to do that. It's important. And are we all set for the city manager report? Anything else? Thank you, Todd. That's yet another heavy lift. Thank you so much. And please keep us posted. Um, we do need that to be safe. All right, so let's move on to our consent agenda. Do I have anyone who would like to pull an item? Uh, Rochelle? I'd like to pull item F, resolution 2022. All right, anybody else? I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda, agenda minus letter F. I'll second. I'll second. All right, thank you. Motion passes. Uh, let's yeah, say, take a vote. Oh, let's take a vote. Thank you very much. All in favor? Aye. Any, no, no, motion passes. Thank you so much, 4-0. And let's see, do we need to read this, Patty? Yes, All right, ma'am. Would you please? Resolution 20, 2022, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, authorizing the mayor to execute an economic development incentives agreement with AeroClean Technologies Incorporated, providing an effective date for other purposes. The reason I pulled uh, F resolution 20 was just to highlight AeroClean. When we approved the conceptual agreement, um, uh, for uh, the uh, incentives, the economic development incentives for this. Uh, we didn't know who it was. And um, they received their certificate of occupancy in May of, of 2021. And I really want to say thank you. They've been out in the community nonstop. They've been a big supporter of the Palm Beach North Chamber and they are very visible at a lot of our city activities. Uh, they're a growing company, they've just gone public, and Jason DeBona and, and his team uh, are really making a home here in Palm Beach Gardens, and um, it's exciting that uh, we have the opportunity to help out to bring uh, good jobs to this, uh, this community through a company like AeroClean, so that's the only reason I pulled it. Thank you, Vice Mayor Led. Anyone else? All right. Moving on. Uh, next, we have public hearings. Oh, I need a motion. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll make right. a motion. Wonderful. For to accept uh, item F on the consent agenda, resolution 20 2022. I'll second. Right. Wonderful. Thank you. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No. Motion passes 4 0. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for helping me with that. <laughs> Next, we have public hearings. We do not have any quasi-judicial meeting um, eating items tonight. Uh, for non-quasi-judicial, we have uh, Patty, if you could be so kind as to read the title for Ordinance 2, 2022. Ordinance 2, 2022, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving a text amendment to the City's Comprehensive Land Use Plan to add a new property rights element and text amendments to the future land use element transportation element, infrastructure element, conservation element, and capital improvements element to remove the urban growth boundary, including an amendment to the future land use map to remove the urban growth boundary, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, DEO, and other reviewing agencies, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. Note to the public, there is a sign-in sheet for anyone wanting additional information from the Department of Economic economic opportunity at the front table. Thank you so much. I'm going to open the hearing. Has anything changed since first reading? No? 
Adam Martin, Mayor. yes. Uh, for the record, Martin Fitz, Planning and Zoning. Uh, nothing has changed with the ordinance since the first reading. Uh, this It was sent to the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. We did receive our letter from them uh, that there would be no uh, nothing rising to the uh, to the status of an objection. Uh, we also received a notice from the Flor from the uh, Treasure Coast um, Regional Planning Council uh, after the notice period, of course. Uh, so there was no uh, objections there either. So everything was everything's fine. Excellent. Thank you very much. Is anyone wishing to speak on this item or have another presentation? No. All right. And I do not have any comment cards, so I'd like to close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second to approve, please? So moved. All right. All in favor? Oh, sorry. Second. second. Go ahead. I'll second. Lovely. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed? Motion passes 4-0. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Great work. Thank you. All right. Moving right along. We do not have any resolutions on the agenda tonight, so we're going to move on to items for council action and discussion and items of interest. Uh, before we dig into appointments to external boards and committees, um, I will, does anyone else have, any, have anything that they want to speak about before then? And then I have one or two things. I have something real quick. All right, please do. Um, on June 2nd, at our June 2nd meeting, I'd like to ask the council if we could have the meeting at 5 o'clock instead of 6 o'clock. Um, it is the Leadership Palm Beach County celebration. Every year they put it on a council night, mm -hmm. and, and Chelsea and I aren't able to go, but this year Chelsea's nominated for a Public Sector Leadership Award, and it would be really nice if we could do our meeting at 5 so that we could get to the celebration. I would have to take time off work, so I can't really um, say that, but I'll be late if that's the case. I'll just come here right after I can. You'll still be? Because I work until five. So it takes me about 30 minutes if I have no traffic to get here, but I will try my hardest would, to be would here on Would 5.30 work for? It's fine. That, that would give you that would give you the extra wanna, half an hour. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I don't want to cause alarm. I could be a little bit late if I have to be. I, I'll try my hardest to leave early. And what about as staff? Early as on, I can on this. I don't mean it. Uh, don't do any. Don't change it for me because I can. Yes, staff. Staff can uh, go right. home a little earlier that night. <laughs> does this have to? Does this have to be an official vote since Mark's not here and we don't know what Mark's um, work schedule is either? He'll have to adapt because he's not yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it will require a motion and a vote because you establish your meeting dates and times by motion and vote. Yeah. All right. So we can do it if I, okay. Then I make a motion that we move the uh, June second meeting to five p.m. 5 PM. All right. Do I get a second? I'll second. Thank you so much. Motion uh, approved. Uh, aye. Any, all in favor? Aye. aye. Okay. Mark doesn't get a choice. Uh, <laughs> motion passes. Thank you. That You're was welcome. really thoughtful. I was just going to miss it. Yeah, you got to remind us. Well, let's hope I. I we'll see who wins. Right. Goodness gracious. Aye, aye, aye. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, I just want to take a moment to thank our Palm Beach Gardens Youth Athletic Association for the beautiful dedication of the bench. We will never, ever forget Ryan Rogers, and it was a, a, a moving ceremony and an honor to see so many of our recreation staff and first responders there. Uh, so thank you so much to the PBGYAA, and I also want to take a moment to thank Ed Weinberg and his son Patrick and our folks at Avenir who took a good amount of our staff out to the natural area to see all of the hard work they've done. So I hope that everyone enjoyed it. We can go back out again anytime you want to. And then we're going to move on to appointments and external boards and committees, if we can go ahead and dig in. Has everyone reviewed your chart that was in the agenda? Yeah. All right. Well, we can... Since Mark's not here, we can nominate him for everything. Let's, yeah, I think Mark that. gets it all, and uh, that's it. Meeting adjourned. No, I'm just teasing. All right, so let's start at the very beginning. The Palm Beach County League of Cities, um, Vice Mayor Litt has been highly involved in that. Would you like to continue to stay there? I would. I've been on that committee for five years now, and I think continuity for my last year would be a good idea, so oh. I would love to stay on that one. Any discussion on that in specific at all? Anyone? Sounds good to me. All right, so it looks like we are all generally alternates together on that one. 
Next, we have the North County Intergovernmental. It has previously been uh, Vice Mayor Litt and Council Member Tinsley. It looks like it's the mayor that then moves in, so I'll move into the appointment. And then as far as being alternate. I'll be happy to stay as the alternate. That's fine. Okay, lovely. Patty, am I going too fast? We're good? You got this. Okay, in your sleep you could do this. Uh, Palm Beach Transportation Agency. Oh, please, may I stay? I'd, li I'd love to stay as the... <laughs> I'm happy to be your alternate. And Marcy, you've done a wonderful job as my alternate. Thank you so much. There's some great stuff coming in. You made ahead. it easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then Seacoast is our uh, Mr. Ferris. We've got the Bioscience Land Project, um, excuse me, Projection Advisory Board. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Is, is there a need for an alternate for that? I don't think so. For Seacoast? We've, I, I don't see uh, anybody there, but do you need an alternate? I, I, they never meet. Oh. <laughs> I knew I'll be an alternate that. for that. <laughs> That's a good job to have. That's all you. All right. That's, That's a all great Marcy. spot. You found Perfect. a good one. Yeah, very good one. Thank you. Uh, Bioscience Land Protection Advisory Board was previously um, Council Member Marciano. And oh, well, there he is again. Yeah, I think Mark all got right. that one again. And I was the alternate. And um, would you like to do that? No, I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'll be the alternate. Sounds great. Palm Beach Workforce Alliance Consortium with Career Source. This is so wonderful and impactful. Um, previously, Vice Mayor Litt with um, Council Member Marciano as number two. That's usually a mayor's, a mayor's uh, spot. vote with yep. uh, somebody as a backup. Excellent. Would anyone? So if, if, you, if you want to leave Mark, Mark, <laughs> leave Mark. I mean, yeah, let's leave Mark. You want the backup, or you want to leave Mark as the backup on I was career the source? You guys. Which one are you guys on? Career, the career, career source. source. No, make Mark the backup. Okay, Mark's, okay. Mark's staying on there. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Mark. All right, uh, Palm Beach North Sustainability Subcommittee. I founded and chair that, and I'm lucky enough to have our vice mayor as my uh, co-chair, so I'll probably step down from that at the end of the year, and so. So you want to you keep that as the yeah, appointee, and I'll be, I'll be I can take the um, alternate yes, position please. officially. That would be great. Thank and you guys for putting that on here, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Palm Beach North Economic Development Committee, previously Mark and Rochelle. Shall we leave it that way? Good with me. Or so, do you want to flip it? Does it matter for that's you guys? Nice. I know Mark is able to make it. He does schedule around it. That's good with me. He can do economic. Okay. Committee. Uh, Palm Beach North Government Affairs Committee, uh, previously. Uh, I can stay at that one. All right, and then that's all of us as your alternate, mm -hmm. so you're bound to have coverage. Yeah. Uh, Loxahatchee River Coordinating Council, that would be you that's again. An, that's, another, that's another one that meets a lot. Okay. okay, so do you need an alternate for that? Carl, you want to be alternate yeah. for that one? Yeah, okay. sure. Carl, alternate for that one. Or would we make Mark that? <laughs> Are you interested in that? Yeah, that's fine. I, I think we'll have coverage yeah. there, no worries. Yeah. Uh, Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, I'm um, that's appointed. appointed. Yeah, they appointed me. I haven't needed an alternate. My alternate is actually Debbie CRC from North mm -hmm. Palm. Uh, Multi jurisdictional issues coordination forum, that is also traditionally the mayor, although Rochelle, you've done that a long time. And that one, I like to stay with only because it involves the workforce housing it's and county some and countywide legislation. Is that possible that for it with. not to be the mayor? Would that be okay? Well, why don't the mayor be the mayor? Alternate, I'll be the alternate. You, you can, oh. or you can be it, and I I'll can be the, the I'll alternate, it, and, and you Rochelle don't can go. Be my alternate. Either Done. way. Okay, so I'll. Do it I'm, that way. I'm, yeah, Rochelle will be my alternate. And then you don't have to go. I can always alternate if you know. <laughs> I mean, your T, your TPA and and the other planning agency mm -hmm. take up a lot of time, and they tend to overlap with this one sometimes. Oh, I see. Excellent. Okay, good to so, know. All right. That's and then lastly, we have the Local Workforce Development Board, um, and that is not a council appointment necessarily. Anything I need to know about that? It's all set? Okay. All right. Beautiful. Very efficient. That was quick. Like yeah, lovely. All right. So thank you so much, everyone. I just need to find my last piece of paper. Before we adjourn, I do want to say thank you to um, Rochelle. You did an excellent job as our mayor, and I appreciate all of your leadership um, and working with you this past year. Thank you. I've enjoyed having you back on council. Thank you. It's glad to be back. It's it an is. honor. It really is a family. So uh, thank you all so much for coming tonight. With that, our meeting is adjourned.